True Riches Sermon Library is proud to have been named one of the top 15 Kentucky Christian podcasts by Feedspot. Visit Feedspot.com for more information. We're in 2 Samuel chapter 12. We're going to pick up on the tail end of the story and then I'm going to, I'll fill in a little bit. So if you'll follow along, starting at verse 1. The Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, There were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb he had bought. He raised it, and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup, even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then David said to, Nathan said to David, You are the man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah, and if all this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. Let's pray. Dear, Dear precious Father, Father thank, thank you for your word. Lord, in your word is life, wisdom, and knowledge. Open our hearts and minds to what you would have to say to us today. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The story, of course, is dealing with David and Bathsheba, where David was up on top of one of the parapets of his castle, and he looks down, he sees Bathsheba bathing. He uh, succumbs to, to the temptation commonly felt, and lies with her, and they have a child. And, and then, then he's got to figure out what to do. So he tries two or three things. He tries to get Uriah drunk. He brings him home from the battle, tries to get him drunk so that he would go into his wife. But even drunk, he had too much character. He would not uh, enjoy that pleasure while his fellow soldiers were in the field. Eventually, David had to tell his general, Joab, to put Uriah in the very heat of battle to where he would surely be killed. And that's what he did. They were battling the Amorites, as our scripture says. Joab put him on the front line, and sure enough, he was killed. He thought he had covered his tracks. He thought he had, he had kept anyone from really knowing what was going on. But the Lord knew, of course. And he sent Nathan to give this prophecy against him. And Nathan drew David in with this story about the rich man and the poor man with two sheep. And David, in righteous indignation, says, that's wrong. That man deserves to die and to repay. And that's when Nathan leveled that charge. You are the one. David did grievously. God had made him king over Israel, the best king Israel has ever had. Expanded the kingdom mightily. The kingdom found peace. They grew. David started the temple. Solomon finished it. David is described as having a whole heart for God. Even though he sinned, and that can be an encouragement to us because it doesn't mean he never sinned, but he did desire to serve God. He succumbed to this temptation. But when God called him on it, he repented and he turned from that sin. David was started out just a 
probably a teenage boy out herding his father's sheep. They describe him as ruddy in complexion. Nobody thought he was keen material. Samuel didn't even think so. But God said, this is the one, anoint him king. And then he started having success after success. He went into battle. And the people would say, David is, uh, Saul has slain his thousand, David his ten thousand, and the people gave great praise to him. And of course, you know the story of David and Goliath, where David was insulted by Goliath, insulting the armies of Israel and God, and he stood up to him when none of the soldiers were, would, and God took that stone and hit Goliath dead in the center of the forehead, and he fell over dead. So David was a person of great courage. We're told later in Scripture that he often faced bears and lions going to attack the sheep, and he would uh, face them down with his sling and kill them, and he faced down Goliath. So he had a, he had a character, he had a courage that God recognized and he had a heart for the things of God. So God made him king over Israel. And he led Israel well, even though he did sin in this way. Psalm 51, which is uh, one verse, verse 17, is our scripture for today, is David's response. It's a psalm he wrote after he had been confronted by Nathan and after he had had uh, repented of his sins. And I'm going to start reading chapter 51, verse 10, a very familiar passage. David says, Create in me a pure heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then... I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will turn back to you. Save me from blood guilt, O God, the God who saves me, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, Lord, O oh God, you will not despise. David realized that in this time that bringing the various sacrifices that God had decreed, that God had told them to do when they committed a sin, were not going to satisfy God, that they were, were acts to cover the sin, but God was more concerned with David's heart, with David's attitude. And that's why he says, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. That is my sacrifice to you. So this incident brought David to a place of brokenness. He had let the trappings of being king go to his head. He had let the, the adulation and all that he had received from the people make him think he might be above the law, above being challenged. And certainly no one would have uh, challenged him with his uh, relationship with Bathsheba or what he did there. He's the king after all. But of course God did. God did not let him get away with that. And so he experienced this brokenness. He pleads for God's forgiveness and God's cleansing. He recommits himself to do what God has called him to do. He says, then I will teach transgressors your way. And he acknowledges that God didn't want some ritual act. He wanted his heart changed. And that's what God is concerned with with all of us. I've shared with you before, and it bears repeating, that the most important thing God is in De desires in your life is your faith to be a deep, deep faith in Him. And He will work in your life to develop that faith. God knows that as you have faith in Him, 
all the other concerns that we have will be taken care of. That we don't have to worry. Uh, Jesus told us that, look at the flowers of the field, look at the birds of the air. God is aware of each and every one of those. And if he cares for them, he'll surely care for you. And so God is concerned with deepening our faith. And sometimes we go through a period of brokenness to get there. The Apostle Peter, in my estimation, probably the second greatest apostle behind Paul, a powerful preacher. He was the one in the book of Acts that stood up after Pentecost and started leading the people, started leading the apostles. He, he stood up against the Jewish leaders. He defied them. He preached the Messiah even though it could mean his death. He was a very courageous person. But we also know the other side of Peter. He was, he was the one that when Jesus said, I need to die for you, he said, may it not be so. And Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. He's the one in the garden that acted impulsively when the soldiers came as they were praying. He took a sword and cut off Malchus' ear. And of course, Peter's the one there in that courtyard when Jesus is being accused and tried that he denies he ever knew him. And then the cock crowed. Peter became a broken person. And that brokenness hit him deeply and caused him to really recommit to serving God. He became so dedicated to Jesus Christ that when he died, tradition tells us, he asked to be crucified upside down because he did not consider himself worthy to be crucified in the same way as his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's the extent he went to his brokenness. There are other examples. Uh, the Apostle Paul in Acts 1-9, Paul, or Acts 9, chapter 1, Paul is breathing murderous threats against the Christians. He's seeking them out. He's having them put to death. He's having them stoned. And Jesus meets him on the road of Damascus. And he comes to him. Jesus does. Suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground. Verse 4. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, who are, you are persecuting. And the King James says, it is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. The pricks were goads that were used on beast burden to keep the oxen moving or the donkey or the mule. They would kind of poke them with a stick. And this tells me that God had been calling to Saul. He'd been goading him, prodding him, trying to get him to know who he was. And finally, Paul, in, in being so, so stalwart in his faith, not giving up, God had to strike him blind on that road to Damascus to stop him. But Paul went through that period of brokenness and became the greatest apostle in the Bible, wrote the most books, tremendous doctrinal teaching, and God does this. God did not cause them to sin. God did not cause Paul to do his actions. He didn't cause Peter to deny him. He didn't cause David to have this bad affair. But those events God used as to, to challenge these men to a deeper walk with him, they responded in repentance and forgiveness, and God was able to deepen their faith. God deals with us this way in Hebrews chapter 12. We read, In your struggle against sin, you have not re yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son. It says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. Do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines the ones he loves, and he chastens everyone 
he accepts as a son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of spirits and live? God cares for us just as we care for our children. You may have heard, I heard my parents say, and you may have even said, this hurts me more than it hurts you. As a young person, I didn't believe it. My tan hide was stinging from the spankings, and I thought that didn't hurt you at all. But as a parent, I developed a deeper wisdom, and I understood that it is not a pleasurable thing to have to discipline a child, to have to take that kind of action, whether it's, whether it's cutting off an allowance, putting them in a corner, whatever that discipline is, it's hard. You would rather have fun with them. You would rather do good things with them. But in order to help them grow into the adult you know they need to be, you exercise discipline. Discipline, of course, is not just punishment. That's what we think of sometimes. Certainly as an athlete and we're striving to do something, we have to be disciplined in our practice and how much we run and how much we live and whatever so that we become a capable athlete in all of life. We need to exercise discipline if we're going to be a student. If we're going to develop a career, we have to be disciplined to study, to learn the material. That's not a punishment, though it feels like it is sometimes. It is uh, something we choose to do that we do in order to become adept and capable. So God didn't cause these sins in these people's lives but he used them to grow them into the persons he needed them to be to propagate the gospel, to carry forth the word of God. Meekness is defined as strength under control. It is not weakness. Matter of fact, it, it is a great strength. When I was a child, uh, not a child, a teenager, I worked at a Christian camp in the summer. And one of the tasks I had was getting horses ready for trail rides to take the children on trail rides. And, and I would brush the horses, I would, I would saddle them, put the blanket on, put the saddle on, tie the saddle on and cinch it up, and uh, learn the tricks of the horses where they hold their breath. And then when you're done, they let it out so the saddle's loose. And if you don't catch that, then uh, it'll fall off. And, of course, we were transporting children, so we needed them safe. Sometimes we would get uh, new horses, and they had to be broken in. They had to be made ready to be able to carry children. And because of what our purpose was, we didn't break them like you see in the Old West movies where somebody would jump on their back and they would buck and bronc and finally give in. We would tend to just get them used to human touch. We would go out into the pasture when they were young. And I can remember while they were laying down, I would, I would kneel down to them and pet them and get them used to us. We wanted them to be broken in a gentle fashion so that they could carry the children safely. Those horses were still very powerful, very fast. They could, they could run over me in a heartbeat, run over any one of them. So in breaking them, we did not lessen their strength. We just made their strength controllable. We made it to where they would obey us, where they would follow when we used the bridle to pull them one way or another, to slow them down, to, to spur them on, although we didn't use spurs, of course, just our heels. So... That type of that brokenness where we broke them in was not reducing their capabilities, was not weakening them. It was just making it something that we could control 
to, for the good of the children that we were transporting through the forest. And that's what brokenness is in our life. God has created us with, he's given us talent, intelligence, great abilities. He's provided us with education and life experiences. When you became a Christian, he gave you a spiritual gift to use in service to him. Our basic human nature is to use all those attributes for our good, to make us money, to get us a bigger house, a better car, to take care of us, and that's a normal, natural thing. But God gave us those abilities and knowledge so that we could be a powerful witness for him. But he needs that under his control. Too often we don't do as God desires, too often we fail. Sometimes our failure comes from sin like David did. Sometimes it just comes even though we do our well-intentioned actions. Even though we're doing the right thing, it just doesn't, doesn't click. It doesn't fit. And we get discouraged. We get uh, depressed. We, get, we want to give up. God will use that. He'll work in our lives. He'll attempt to use that failure, that, that lack of achievement we desire to get us to turn our hearts to Him and to yield whatever we're doing to Him. Sometimes He needs to point us in a different direction. Sometimes He just needs to get us to be sure we're doing what we're doing for His sake to propagate the mission for Him. We're still the capable person he created. We're still that talented person. But as we go through this brokenness and we yield all of ourselves to him, we then get a synergy of all the abilities and who he's made us to be is synergized with his power, with his Holy Spirit, and we see him blessing in ways that we can never imagine. When events occur, we have some choices. God gave us free will. He doesn't force this on us. We can refuse to be broken. Sometimes we may tilt against windmills, in all reference to Don Quixote. We can spit into the wind, I think, of the Jim Croce song. Some of you may remember what I'm thinking. We can shake our fists at the moon and rage about how it's so unfair. We're, we're, we, we, we're just angry and we rage. Or we can realize that we can, we've been acting on our own wisdom and strength for our own benefit, in well-intentioned or not. So we can repent of our actions. We can receive God's forgiveness when it's something wrong, purchased through Jesus' sacrifice, and we recommit ourselves to living for Him. Even if it is an grievous sin like David, we can realize the focus of our actions and choose to follow God more closely. God can do great and mighty things beyond our natural abilities. He can open the storehouses of heaven and blessings pour out. And he'll do those kind of things as we yield to him, use who he made us. And in the meantime, he will take care of all of our personal needs. He'll see that we have what we need. We will see souls come to receive him as Savior and Lord because we yielded our lives in obedience to the Father. That's what David was talking about. After this sin, create in me a clean heart, O God. Then I will teach transgressors your way. He says earlier, Lord, if you smite me from this earth, who's going to lift your name? So David, in his repentance, recommits to serve God and what God wanted him to do, to honor God. And that's what we can do. God's deepest desire for you is to have a deep, abiding faith in Him. 
and he will allow us to be broken because it can be a tool to lead us to greater reliance on him. As I was preparing this, I'm very sensitive because I'm getting to be one more and more. The how we can feel as seniors that we can think sometimes, well, my time is over, and and it's not. There's there's much we can do, and we're going to be calling upon you to do that as we go through the days. One of the things that you can do that is critical, crucially important, is good, faithful, effective prayer. Everything we do needs to be undergirded with prayer. And you can talk to God and speak to Him. But what I thought of was the poem by Dylan Thomas, written in 1947, to his father. His father's dying. He felt like his father was kind of giving up on life, just letting, letting it come. And he was angry with his dad. He wanted his dad to, to fight. And so he wrote these words that you've heard before. This is just the first verse. Do not go gentle into that good night. Old age should burn and rage at the close of day. Rage, rage against the dying of the and he was just saying to his father, don't give in. Keep living your life up to the very end. Keep doing all you can do. And I know it's difficult as I feel the soreness from my hiking yesterday. And my hips last night, I asked Sue to drive home because I could, I could barely sit in the seat and, and drive. But God has not called us home yet. He needs each and every one of us. We as a body are here to minister to our community. We need each and every one doing what each and every one can do. And we cannot afford to give in to the dying of the light. We need to rage, rage against that day. God disciplines us for our good. Paul talked about discipline when he talked about when the runner's running for his race, he lays aside every weight that hinders him. That's what God calls us to do, to trust him for our day-to-day -day needs, to yield ourselves to him, and to see what he can do as we serve him for the purpose he called us, which is telling others about Jesus Christ. So understand, when you go through those periods in life, when you're disappointed and discouraged, that as you turn to God, you ask Him for evaluation, to examine your heart. Was there a sin like David? Was there something wrong that needs to be repented and turned away from? Or were you in the right place, maybe the wrong time, and you just need to yield to him and say, okay, Lord, show me that place you would have me fulfill your mission. Ask him, turning everything over to him. What do you want, Lord? Some of us were remembering not too long ago, well, not too long ago, back in the 70s, when... Uh, uh, when the movement WWJD was going around. Remember what that stands for? What would Jesus do? The fad is gone. We don't have the bracelets. You can still buy them, but we, you know, kids don't wear them. Used to, we made beads with them and all kinds of things. But it's still a valid question. Wherever we are, whatever's going on in our life, Jesus, what would you do in this situation? Listen and respond. That's what he's calling. He wants to bless you by being in his service to see things you could never do on your own. 
Let's stand and we'll have prayer, and Mark will come and lead us in our closing hymn. Dear precious Father, Lord, sometimes, often, too often, I whine and complain at hardship instead of, Lord, I'm the clay, you're the potter. How is it you're molding me? What is it you see in me that you know, know, know needs to be smoothed out, rounded, made useful? Lord, create in me a clean heart to where I want whatever you want, that I want to follow you wherever you you lead me. And Lord, give me that strength through your Holy Spirit to do what I need to do to follow the discipline of being a Christian who calls upon your name. Lord, I ask your blessings upon each one here. Lord, may you bless them by speaking to them clearly of what you would have them do. Lord, those who are at a stage in life they just don't feel like they've got anything to offer anymore, let them know what they can do. Let them know they're still yours, they're still your child, and you're still embracing them, you're still calling, you still value them. Lord, let all of us know that. Thank you for Jesus Christ. In him we have eternal life. In him we have the resurrection. In him we have your Holy Spirit abiding within us to give us knowledge and strength. Lord, help us to not kick against the pricks and to respond to your calling. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.